and this is coming from the Odyssey. It says, they never plant with their own hands or plow the soil. They have no meeting place for counsel, no laws either. The Cyclops have no ships. These creatures are even isolated from each other. Up on the mountain peaks, they live in the arching caverns, each a law unto himself. Each a law unto himself. Each a law unto himself. The history of our Earth is so different from what we can imagine. Enjoy the journey. The Smithsonian, that if they found out about a large skeleton somewhere, was to go get it. I'm going to assume at least one person is right, because if one person's right, it busts the paradigm. It all goes back to the fallen chair. And the problem with the modern day church, they have a very truncated view of the supernatural. This backdrop that's just pregnant with all kinds of meaning associated with this Mount Hermon event. And this guy defects from the kingdom. That's a big deal. All right, Luke. All right, Nate. Welcome back to the one and only Blurry Creatures. We're out there in your ears, wherever you are, whether that you are a dentist, a stay-at-home mom, an esthetician, a massage therapist, whatever you're doing out there. Or you're a demon hunter. You're getting blurry. And we appreciate you being on this journey with us. Luke, you're looking good, man. I can't see the lettuce, but... Thanks. It's covered up right now. It's wintertime, Nate. It's beanie weather. Or toque, or toboggan, or sock hat. Depends what you call it. My wife calls it a sock hat. She's from Indiana, so that's a little weird, but it's all right. I think you got to call it a toque if you listen to this show. Or if you're a Canadian, you call it a toque for sure. Very Lord of the Rings. Heck yeah. Well, welcome back, guys. Thanks for listening to the show and sharing it with friends. We have Derek Olson, the megastar from Megalithic Marvels, coming on talking about Cyclops. We've been teasing at this show a long time. We posted a few things on our channels about some newspaper clippings and some rumors and history of the Cyclops. But Luke, I've been I'm excited because I know Derek does his research. I know he, he I know he really he really dives in. So yeah, he's a research guy. Cyclops, the original all seeing eye, right? The original <laughs> all seeing eye. You know the Cyclops, they probably focused on making things because they just couldn't see the ladies very well. Well, they worked in two D, right? I guess the women probably didn't pay attention to them very much. Well, at least he could he, you know they could always go. Well, I've got my eye on you. Oh, uh, there's always Luke, <laughs> ready for that that zinger. That zinger. Oh, man. Well, yeah. keeping an eye on you, Nathan. Keeping an eye on you. I I like you. <laughs> That's all I got, man. My, I have COVID brain right now. I mean, what if you were colorblind in, in one eye? <laughs> <laughs> colorblind in your one eye. Or if you get old and your eye starts to get bad, things get pretty blurry. <laughs> Ah, see what I did there, Luke? Anyways, everyone out there who uh, enjoys this show, if you want to become a member and support the show and keep this show ad-free and fun, every episode takes you know multiple hours, seven, seven plus hours between recording, booking, editing, music, all the good stuff. We put a lot of time in this show. If you want to become a member, blurrycreatures.com slash members. You get access to unreleased episodes, long episodes, members chats, a Facebook group, lots of fun stuff. So, and you get private own, you get your private RSS feed. So head over to blurrycreatures.com slash members. Our buddy and pal from Megalithic Marvels, Derek Olson, is up next. Oh, I'm half dead there, uh, Derek, but, but the show must go on. 
Man, you guys are, I mean, you are dedicated. You've got COVID and you're still recording shows. Got to go, man. Got to go. Dude, we got to hear about the Cyclops. I mean, there's there's no, uh, no virus is going to hold Nate down. Yeah. <laughs> I just figured, what else is coming? They got one eye. Nate has one lung. It's just, it's, you, it's really the theme right now. You start podcasting about the demons. You never know what's coming at you. That's correct. Well, you look good, man. Um, <clears throat> Thanks, dude. I saw you know your previous Instagram uh, video, kind of sharing with the audience what was going on, and man, it looked like uh, you had it pretty bad, maybe, huh? Yeah, it's this is two weeks, and I still feel like I'm hacking up a lung. You sure you're up for this still? Yeah, man. Let's talk about the Cyclops builders, bro. Yeah. On, I mean, dude. I mean, without blurry, just a lot of worry. So, oh, look, he's got rhymes, baby. Let's get out of that. Let's get out of that headspace. No, man, this has been awesome. It's what I want to do. I feel like since my since my band ended in 2009, man, I've been looking for something that I can pour my heart into. And I'm more thankful for this show and the friends we've met. I mean, we come on we come on members chats and people start praying for us. And, you know, I got people calling me. Judd was calling me, asking me how I'm doing. He had a similar thing happen in his life. And so it's been you know, this podcast has been way more than just let's interview people and get on to the next one and try to build our channel. You know, it's just yeah. people are connecting to it. And, and we've and I find like I feel a sense of purpose with it. And I feel like I get to use my creative gifts and make make people laugh and make people think. And it's fun, even though I don't feel like I feel dumb. So I just feel like it's hard, man. I, we have that imposter syndrome of who are we? Like, we don't know. We, we're not ancient historians. We don't know. We haven't read all the books. We're just two dummies. Yeah. Come yeah. on. That makes three of us. Big old dummies. And yeah, I, I feel the same way. But it's that's what I think God blesses because we know it's not all about us. Sure. But welcome back to the show, the one and only, the Mega Man. The Mega Man. Derek Olson, the one and only. Off, often imitated, but never replicated. <laughs> yeah. Great to be back with you, fellas. Thank you so much for having me. Super excited about our topic for this show. In, are you guys ready? We are going in search of Cyclops. Yeah. Mm-hmm. One-Eyed Willie, you know, it goes all the way back to the Goonies. <laughs> Just back to the 80s, not too far back. It's no big deal. That's a, that's as far back as we go. <laughs> Luke's 83, I was 80. Well, I'm 82, bro. Come on now. 82, 82. Hey, what month were you, Nate? November 1980. Got you beat. I am a February 2nd, 1980. Dang. You guys just Groundhog. snuck it in. You would have made the hockey team. I would have got cut. <laughs> Groundhog Day, also, also a fabulous movie. Oh, man. I read that book, Outliers, and he said hockey players are born in the first three months of the year. And you are an outlier, my friend, Derek, from Megalithic Marvels, because you pursue and talk about things that nobody else will. You are considered an alternate historian and researcher because you don't fit the narrative. You don't fit the mainstream. And people laugh about this Cyclops topic. But it has been coming up nonstop on our show. And we even early on, we even posted some news articles about people who digging up these things. And we've been talking about the masonry surrounding these. And Luke, I'm excited because I know this guy, this man likes to do his research and dig in. So I know. I'm excited. And you teased us for a while. That's yeah. been like, what, eight weeks or so we've been talking about it? <laughs> He's been holding that carrot out there. Just can't quite get there. The hey, I, yeah. I just, I needed more and more time to research. Uh, so I, I think I've done the research and I hope that I don't disappoint because it sounds like, man, this has been an exciting topic on your show. And yes, I am proud to wear the badge of an alternative researcher. I proudly wear that badge. Yeah. So we're talking about in search of Cyclops and kind of a map of where we're going. I first want to talk about the origins of Cyclopean architecture. Mm. Then we're going to move to some of the Greek mythology and legends of the Cyclops, plural Cyclopes. And then we're going to go to, we're going we're gonna to hit on some other oral traditions of Cyclopes from around the world. Then we're going to talk about possible modern day reports of discoveries of Cyclopes. And then we're going to get to the really crazy stuff that I've found. <laughs> Let's go. That's a, that'll be the teaser. I won't mention that. Yet. Ah, that's what, come on, Nate. He's so good. We don't want to so read. Good. You want to read the last chapter? If we're going to start at the beginning. Yeah. 
Let's exactly. just say I've laughed at this topic most of my life, but after this research, let's just say I'm becoming a believer. Yeah. The metaphorical Bigfoot has come out of the woods and shown himself to you, and you believe. Right. Yeah, you, saw, you saw his eye, and now you're a believer. <laughs> so let's talk about the origins of cyclo- cyclopean architecture. And I know you've had other great guests on, like Al Barino. I'm going to pull some stuff from his book, actually, which is really good. But so the ancients believed that the megalithic architecture that they beheld back in the day was constructed by hybrid demigods. Uh, And this myth was preserved to this very day in terms used by archaeologists to describe these megaliths, which is called cyclopean. And obviously cyclopean coming from the word cyclops. And so cyclopean architecture, if you see it, it consists of massive, what I like to say, megaton polygonal blocks that interlock uh, together without using mortar. And so they were designed essentially to be earthquake proof. When earthquakes hit, seismic activity, they would flex, they would sway during these cataclysms. When we look look at megaliths from around the world, you know, there's locations like Saxe Oman in Peru or Giza and Abydos in Egypt. These sites get most of the attention for like incredible megaliths, but there is megalithic constructions in ruins scattered across Greece that I think are equally impressive in their own right. And the ancients uh, attributed the cyclopes to building these uh, cyclopean uh, walls. And there are several sites, especially in Greece, Mycenae, Tyrans, Keramikos, and even Athens that feature incredible cyclopean architecture. And listeners can go to Megalithic Marvels on uh, Facebook. We got a page, a group, or Instagram, and you can see most of these sites in Greece. And they're incredible. They're polygonal. They're precision. You can't fit uh, a toothpick through them. Now, Mm. if you were a tourist and you were visiting these sites, you know, at first glance, you might not notice the megalithic components and foundations uh, that are still left today. Because again, like we've talked about in previous shows in Peru, these sites have been repurposed, right? Later civilizations came along, especially the Greeks, and they built columns, they built amphitheaters, and they built other inferior constructions around and on top of them. Um, But as you look closer, you can begin to differentiate between the man-made mortar construction and the megaliths built that are precision, that are massive. And so um, something important to note, note is the megaliths that are built out of softer stone like limestone like we see in Greece, these deteriorate a lot quicker than megaliths, like per se in Peru, that were made of granite. Stone in Greece is a lot softer. And so what we're seeing when we talk about Cyclopean ruins, it's just a real dim glimpse of what it once was. Uh, So that's important to note. And that's why the, the megaliths in Greece don't get as much airplay as those in Peru and Egypt, but they're still incredible. So Greek mythology, in Greek mythology, the Cyclops uh, or the Cyclopes, plural, they're the giant one-eyed sons of the gods. They were master masons, blacksmiths, metal workers. They were the craftsmen, essentially, of the golden age. And Europe's tradition of the Cyclops is that they were these artisans who lived under the earth and kind of it lends to they, they live subterranean lives and they were metallurgists who retained the knowledge of the gods, right? And so, again, they're thought to be the builders of the cyclopean structures we see, especially in Greece and Italy, but also around the world. And I like what Al Barino says in his new, new book, Birthright. He talks about how the elites of the prehistoric world They possessed, obviously, a shared knowledge that enabled them to construct these megaliths. And um, the megaliths alone, he says, bear witness to the knowledge that was lost in the great cataclysm. I love how he terms that the megaliths alone that we see today bear witness to the knowledge that was lost in the great cataclysm. And so megalithic ruins displaying the trademark technique of Cyclopean masons The reality is they've been discovered on all four hemispheres. And so the simplest explanation 
uh, for the universality of the megalithic phenomenon is to assume that an advanced global civilization once populated the earth until it was utterly destroyed in a worldwide cataclysm. We see this in Mesoamerica, Egypt, Mesopotamia, Greco-Roman. So it's illogical to conclude that these stories originate from the same source. So that's kind of a backdrop of the origins of Cyclopean architecture. Is this good so far, guys? Great, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we've, we've talked about how many tribes of giants there were. And I think when people say giants, they probably don't realize there was a there was probably physical anomalies to different tribes. You know what I mean? There was probably a whole, whole ho host of different types of of giants. Like the that's just a very generic term, in some sense. I mean, you know, the first time you hear the topic, you think, oh yeah, well they were just large beasts. But then you kind of when you dig into the like you go to like newspaper articles and you you read about some of the stuff they dug up and there's ones with horns there's dwar there's all kinds of crazy stuff that they dug up and the one I Cyclops just do you think that they're the best that they were like you know they were the Barry Bonds of of laying stone or what yeah without the cream and the clear yeah yeah like pre 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 growing head Barry Bonds yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they were the uh, giants that were definitely on roids, and um, <laughs> <laughs> when, they, they must have been. When the cataclysm happened and, and God sent the flood and wiped out everyone but Noah and his family, all these giants who had these who had these mysteries of heaven, and th this technology imparted, and they were using it, you know, to, to build and also for evil, they were wiped out, and so with them went this secret knowledge, as maybe the Masons would call it, this secret knowledge of you know of, of masonry and dude i think it's just uh, i think it's such a good foundation no pun intended nate or maybe intended there for you know for starting this discussion is that, that we can go and look and touch and your videos and if you look at megalithic marvels there's you, you can go and see you can touch these things that are accredited via mythology and and oral tradition to these one-eyed giants yeah yeah the megaliths alone bear witness to the knowledge that was lost in the great cataclysm. I think that is brilliant thought. And so we've got even guys like uh, you've probably heard of the, the historian, first century historian, Josephus. Yeah. So this guy um, was a first century Roman Jewish scholar, historian. And in, in his writings, he references ancient giants in several places. And here's a quote from his greatest work called the antiquities of the Jews. And again, I think this is important uh, because of the subject we're talking about. This is not the Bible. This is a extracurricular ancient text. And he says, quote, there were till then left the race of giants who had bodies so large and countenances so entirely different from other men that they were surprising to the sight and terrible to the hearing. The bones of these men are still shown to this very day, unlike to any credible relations of other men, end quote. Amazing quote from a first century historian. And to think that in his day, they basically still had these giant bones on display. How crazy is that? Yeah, it's the Smithsonian wasn't around yet. Well, no, I mean, it's always <laughs> been this fascination of humanity that there are these giants around and stories of them and you got to think about the old ancient museums right like everyone needs something weird the creep show right you got to get someone to come in the door and pay their little fee to get in i mean i think that's been going on for a long time right and what, what's so um, intriguing to me and josephus has all kinds of quotes about giants but in this one i want to point to the part where he said they had bodies so large and quote countenances so entirely different from other men that they were surprising to the sight. Is he alluding to possibly Cyclopes right there, right? I think he may be. Now, here's what's important. Notice that Josephus uh, remarks about the countenances. Josephus also notes that fallen angels and women produce children of superhuman strength. And he links these creatures to Greek mythology. So Josephus goes on to say, 
quote, for the tradition is that these men did what resembled the acts of those men, the Grecians called the giants. So Josephus himself dovetails ancient giants with Greek mythology. And so we know the Greeks worshiped Zeus and the Pantheon. And this was a superhuman group uh, that reflected basically the situation we see in Genesis 6, right? Where the giant hybrids are ruling the earth because they have superhuman abilities that can't be matched by mere human beings. And another clue is that the Greek gods um, are often said to be regularly mating with human women to produce offspring. All the giants in the pantheon, including Cyclops, were usually the offspring uh, from the union of a god like Uranus, who represented the sky, and Gaia, who represented the earth. So we see that clue that we can pull from, right? And so the Greek myths, the Roman myths that were based on them are based greatly on greatly modified events that most likely occurred in Genesis 6, right? With the, with the watchers breeding with human women to create the Nephilim giants to rule over them. And so where it gets cool with uh, Greek mythology is that many classical writers, historians like Homer and Hesiod, uh, in their writings, they mention the idea that the Cyclopean ruins uh, of Italy and Europe, Greece in general, were erected by this now extinct Cyclopean race. And a lot of people have heard of the Odyssey, written a credit to the Homer. I think he wrote uh, the Odyssey in about 800 BC. It's like one of the oldest narratives kind of that have withstood the ages. And this text, you know, it really uh, preserves the memory of the age of heroes. And so in the Odyssey, uh, there's the most famous Cyclops ever written about. His name is Polyphemus. And he is again, in Homer's Odyssey, and he's a one-eyed beast, and again, arguably the most famous in the world, and he is presented in the Odyssey as this man-eating monster, and he's an obstacle to uh, Odysseus, the the hero in the story, as he's trying to get home, and so that's kind of our, the most famous mention of uh, a Cyclops, and then there's works of earlier Greek writers, i.e. Hesiod and Homer, So there's two types of cyclopes that we start to find. There's the man-eating monster type I just mentioned. And then there's the other type that's kind of this highly skilled architect that lives uh, underground. And so we've kind of got two classes of cyclopes. And then in Hesiod's writing, Theogony, uh, he mentions three cyclops. These guys are said to have forged thunderbolts for Zeus. And they created the trident for Poseidon. So again, we see them making stuff, right? And in later tradition, the Cyclopes are said to be the smith of the gods and that they worked in the gods' forges under Mount Etna, which was an active volcano on the east coast of Sicily. You, so, so a couple questions. Do you think that the Cyclops, they kind of stay together, kind of like a breed of animal? They would kind of stay together. And there is a lot of talk of UFOs associated with volcanoes, too. And we've talked to Tim Alberino extensively about what he thinks those are. So it's interesting, right? There's always these mountains. They're they're making things, and they're living underground. I mean, it, it's the consistent themes on our show. Those are always coming up over and over and over again. Yeah, it's interesting. I kind of picture these these uh, the the class that's the metallurgist working underground, almost like the um, is it the dwarves? Yeah. Yeah, mining the mountain, right? Yeah, where do you get that from, you know? <laughs> right. The the Cyclopes that Homer talks about, they're different than Hesiod's Cyclopes. Uh, Hesiod presents them as the brutish and civilized creatures, and they appear in the Odyssey, and they're described as also creatures who practice agriculture. And one of the quotes about them is this, and again, this is coming from the Odyssey. It says, they never plant with their own hands or plow the soil. They have no meeting place for counsel, no laws either. The Cyclops have no ships. These creatures are even isolated from each other. Up on the mountain peaks, they live in the arching caverns, each a law unto himself. So that's kind of an interesting uh, little glimpse into maybe the everyday life of a Cyclops. Sounds like a Yeti. Sounds just like a, like a, like a rogue just angry Sasquatch, just doing their own thing. But in some know? places, though, they they're like in in tribes, right? There's these groups of them. 
So they're, I mean, they're really consolidating eyes. When you only got one, I think you probably need a few there so you can really keep an, keep an eye out. Um, <laughs> Watch my back. <laughs> Derek, I got to ask. Like, so one of the things I know about Cyclops is that there's a, there's a lot of association with the island of Sicily. I know that Mount Etna is, is there, but is there, is there, is there construction there? Are there walls there? When we talk about Italy, we talked about Peru and, and Greece. When we talk about Italy. Are there are there certain things that that, you, that people point to that are there? Say they're Cyclopean, you know, structures or or walls. And because there, there's a, when we talk about like we talked about giants before, and the giants are really associated with Sardinia, right? Like in this whole idea that this is the island of giants, and then Sicily kind of has this other. It's like the, some of the giants went to Sardinia, and some of the and then the Cyclops were like, hey, Sicily is ours. We're we're, we're doing what we do here. What is it just the volcano or is there more that connects them to, to that? And then, and then some of the things they built around Italy. No, absolutely. There's definitely megaliths in Italy. Um, I'm looking through my Instagram right now, megalithic marvels to uh, get some of the exact names for you, but yeah, let me find, as I'm talking here, let me find some of the names, sure. but there's, there's definitely megaliths in Italy. Um, while I'm looking for those listeners need to go Google, um, Google Athens and and specifically Google the hill of, uh, I think it's pronounced Pynx, P-Y-N-X. And again, if you had visited this site, you'd just think, oh, this is great Greek architecture. But you look at this cyclopean wall that's, that's left at the base, and it is monstrous, definitely what we would call cyclopean architecture. So um, that's definitely one. And then there's several in Italy. Uh, I'm just struggling to find the names, but we can return to that. I mean, we, with you know, we can edit and return to that. Is there anything that anything with the all seeing eye in relationship to to Cyclops, or is that completely different imagery? Because I, I think it was on your page. Maybe there was there was a a motorless wall, and one of the top bricks there was this all seeing eye, and it's kind of like, man, is that like a I mean, is it a masonry homage? Is that an homage to a, to some cyclopean builder with one eye? I mean, I, I, maybe it's a bad question. We don't have to keep it in the show if it's a bad question. No, no, that's a great question. I and I definitely think there's a parallel to um, the all seeing eye. Yeah, the one you're talking about. I thought that was such a fascinating image because it's almost like a possible signature of the cyclopean builder, right? right. Uh, and so again, whether or not a one eyed giant cyclops existed the bigger thing that we need to understand is that at a bare minimum the legends and the evidence we have of of cyclops and the one eye it represents knowledge it represents the forbidden the hidden knowledge of of the watchers Mm -hmm. the The knowledge they had to create megalithic earthworks and so I think um, that's, it's very interesting, isn't it? That, you know, on the back of our dollar bill, we see that symbolism of this day, the secret knowledge of the elite. Mm. And um, so they had it back then and we know it still exists today. I mean, it's almost in our face today, right? It's funny. I think about our own blurry creatures logo. It's got that one eye and it's a creature eye, right? And it's a UFO as well. It's kind of like a UFO. It's an eye. It's a, it's definitely a creature's eye. I mean, we've got a little bit of flack people going, oh, it's a satanic symbol. But anyway, it's 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 a creature eye, and it's just a one eye. So it's interesting that here we are talking about the Cyclops, and we've had some people, a lot of people ask us about our logo. I don't know. It's come up several times, and it's just like, it's a creature eye, you know? But, but when you like, created it, was it created with Cyclops in mind, or was it totally separate? No, I don't. I, it was it was separate, but I now that I'm looking at it, I'm like, dang, it looks kind of like a cyclops creature. But it but it, but it has that kind of nod back to the what the show's been about that Watcher Tech. No, I love it. I love this topic, and I, it's so it's so ironic that we're talking about cyclops, and the blurry creature blurry creature symbol is basically a cyclops eye. This is awesome. So, real quick, one more thing about Greek mythology. Again, I said the most famous Cyclops that we have information on is the one in in Homer's Odyssey. So let me recount the tale real quick of this. So the Cyclops in Homer's Odyssey is called Polyphemus. 
and he's described as this godlike giant, and he leads the clans of the Cyclops. And so according to Homer, Polyphemus uh, was the son of Poseidon, again, a god, and, the, uh, and, the, and his mother was uh, a woman. So again, making him a demigod, right? So the hero of the Odyssey, uh, Od- Odysseus, reaches this island of the Cyclops. And so I'm kind of picturing something like Sardinia, right? And during his journey, he goes and explores this island and he finds this cave and, and this, this giant Cyclops is inside, Polyphemus. And in the lair of the Cyclops, um, Odysseus and his men encounter him and he basically kills some of his men and eats them. The rest of them escape and Odysseus later returns. And while the giant's sleeping, he plunges a stake into its eye, uh, thus blinding it before escaping the island. So that's kind of the most famous story of a Cyclops that we've got. And then there's some other oral traditions of Cyclops from around the world. In Albanian mythology, there's the Catalan, who's a man-eating giant who lives in a cave and has one eye. There is one called Aramasapi. Uh, they're the legendary people of Scythia, and they're always at war with their neighbors, stealing gold, and they were said to be Cyclopes, who had a single eye in the center of, of their forehead. This one was interesting, Balor. Um, was Balor of the Evil Eye was his name. And he was supposedly a king of a race of giants in Irish mythology. And Balor ruled over uh, a class of people. And he is said to have a giant one eye. And then one more, I can't even pronounce this, Bunjasingus uh, is a one-eyed giant that is found in, in Filipino folklore. And he he supposedly had a great sense of hearing and displays unusual strength. And legend says that the giant was able to lift animals and throw them with such force that his he would end knee deep in the ground. And he had a humanoid shape, large teeth, and long tusks, and it was apparently 10 feet. So hmm. again, just beyond Greek and Roman myths, we've got some other oral traditions. And then you guys referenced that you've talked about some uh, possible reports of discoveries of Cyclops skulls. I found two that seemed to be somewhat credible, published February 27th, 1931 in a Greek newspaper, uh, and I couldn't pronounce the newspaper, but it was titled The Cyclops Skeleton Discovered in Kozani in 1931. And it talks about, uh, there's this region in northern Greece called Kozani, and um, between a couple villages after torrential rains, there were several landslides, and crews were clearing out ground and soil, and they're shocked when under the earth is an ancient marble tomb. And it's it's it said it was colossal, and um, after many hours of trying to open this thing, they open it up and inside is a, a, a giant human skeleton. But what's the craziest part about it is it's got one eye socket right in the middle of the forehead. Right in the middle of the forehead. Right in the middle of the forehead. Right And so uh, that's kind of one of the somewhat uh, possible recent sightings or discoveries. And um, there's another one I found much newer, February 24th, 2002. Um, And this was, I believe, in the Philippines. It's an article titled Cyclops School Baffles Tribal Folk. And it says ancient skulls bearing a single eyeball socket were found in a limestone cave and have been baffling tribal folk in the hinterlands of Bohol. 
uh, the report said. And it talks about um, these skulls resemble those of the Cyclops. And it even talks about the archaeologist Ray Santiago, who uh, excavated them. I looked this guy up. He really exists. And this was in an actual online newspaper, one of the appears to be one of the main Filipino newspapers. So kind of crazy to see that, hey, we might even have some modern day discoveries of Cyclops skulls. What do you think of that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I love think, it. I think I think it's great, especially the one in Greece, right? Because you whenever you bring up skeletons, the common narrative is that it's it's a uh, it, they're confusing it for a mastodon or it's a it's something else, right? And when you find that a, a skeleton inside of a tomb, a marble tomb, it's not a mastodon. Sorry, you're not. You're, there's no misidentification to, to be had there. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people say that. Yeah, you know, they are, there's always an explanation for. Oh, you're just misidentifying X, Y, Z as as you know, it's a dinosaur or a mastodon, or it's kind of hard to do to play that game when you're pulling it out of out of a marble tomb. Um, yeah, and then yeah, and the Philippine stuff is fascinating because you have an archaeologist on record that you can actually Google and look up, and it's not a you know, and they're and they're saying yeah, this is weird. This is <laughs> this isn't the first time I've heard those stories though, Derek, of people pulling giants out of these marble tombs deep down. There was one in there was a couple of them that we posted on our channels of some guys finding them in Italy. Way deep down, they find these marble coffins and they've got giants inside of them. And so it makes you wonder the timeline, the history. But this is like in the 1800s, they dug a lot of these things up and they make the news back then. But and the giants are suspended in stasis. I don't know if I pronounced that right, but have you guys seen some of those YouTube videos where people apparently find these giants that are like suspended in this preserved state? Mm-mm. Pretty far out there, but um, really interesting, interesting to, to say nonetheless. Yeah. I mean, that's more up your alley in terms of gets into the megaliths and it gets into some of this ancient construction in these tombs but we don't really you gotta look that you gotta look that up though man they're in stasis mm. it's like well yeah you, it makes you wonder why are they putting them in these boxes what are they what's the point right and are those those black boxes in the pyramids derek <laughs> i think so yeah, yeah. now Full we know circle. what they were for they were yeah, for right. cyclops <laughs> okay so here's here's to me where it gets crazy again because i'm like a lot of people eh, cyclops that's just greek greek craziness mythology you know but then you kind of Again, you talk about the Cyclopean megaliths, you look at the Greek mythology, you see there's some other oral traditions from around the world. Uh, There's possible modern day uh, reports of discoveries of skulls. And then what if I told you there has been people born with one eye in their forehead? What? Would you believe me? I, I would. Because at this point, anything goes. And so in searching for this show, again, this is what <laughs> really made me take a step back and go, okay, okay, maybe there's a whole lot more uh, about this than I thought. So, I mean, I was basically horrified at what I saw. Photographs. Uh, there's YouTube videos. Really? Uh, that, again, you don't want to probably watch it before you go to bed, but... Uh, babies, babies born alive with to basically look like a cyclops. Mm. Again, science always has something to explain it away. But guess what they call this disorder? Cyclopia. It's a, a they call it a birth defect characterized by the failure of the embryonic something to properly divide the orbits of the eye into two cavities. So here's my question. If this can happen now, why couldn't it happen in prehistory? Hmm. Yeah. I mean, and we hear about this all the time about the giants that have these anomalies, right? Like, um, paradoxically. Yeah. And then they have like double rows of teeth. They've got elongated skulls. They can have one eye. They have six fingers, six toes. You know, some people on our, come on our show and say it's as, it's as easy as when you, admit, when you mix these DNAs, you could have pigment in the skin problems. You could have pituitary disorders. These things could just keep growing. I mean, there's just a bunch of genetic problems when you put the two angelic DNA, human DNA together. So it, it falls in line with everything else you've heard. It's just the one eye, for whatever reason, sounds crazier than maybe an extra finger, you know? Yeah, to anybody, again, that, that doubts this, 
Uh, again, it's on YouTube. And weird. It was basic. It was basically shocking and very hard to see, very graphic, but it was very real as far as I can tell. And again, we also know, like you said, Nate, the the giants, the Nephilim always had these genetic anomalies. And then I also point, I've done a lot of research on the elongated skulls of Peru. Obviously, they're very anomalous. And those things even have missing sutures in the skull. The sutures are the fibrous joints that connect uh, the bones of the skull. Mm -hmm. And so these things have missing sutures. And so again, we see all these genetic anomalies. And um, even today in the 2000s, um, there's people being born with one eye in the middle of their forehead. So pretty crazy uh, to think, how does this connect to the Genesis 6 narrative and the breeding of the watchers? with humans and what we call giants and the possibility of cyclops well i mean maybe this is where the monocle came from you just need you know you just need one one on a chain just like the monopoly guy you know <laughs> i got you nate there you are yeah you're trying to get us to laugh a little bit that's what we try to do see the two dummies we all we can do is make jokes we were talking about that before you came on Derek. that maybe that's why the they were busy working with stone because they were just they had single vision. They were they weren't looking at the ladies like the other the other giants. <laughs> you know, they just couldn't see them. Right. I'm like where where they where'd she go? I don't know. Back to work. I mean, it's like the Cyclops is telling his wife, "I only have an eye for you." Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it gets bad. No, but I it mean, it does get bad. Yeah. It, it gets real bad. So, Derek, because you're because you're a mega you're a megalithic guy. What, what in your mind? What are the three best? If we're gonna, if we're talking about the three best examples of, call him Mega Man, please just call Mega, him Mega Man. Man. There you go. What are the three best examples of Cyclopean architecture, Cyclopean builds that you think you've come across or that you believe to be the best examples of it? Oh man, I would say you got to check out this hill of of Pikes in Athens. Uh, yeah, we maybe we can put this in the show notes. Uh, P Y N X. This thing is so massive. Uh, yet mortarless. Hmm. You can see that they built the whole <clears throat> city of Athens on top of this. It's one of the remaining wall remnants. And then there's there's another style of megalith that is just much finer. Uh, there's a place called Keramikos, and I'll send these to you guys so you can put them in the show notes again, or we can link to them. But this thing looks like you would see at um, the Cori Concha in Peru. It is just such finely fitted mortarless stones that are like super sharp cuts that it's just beyond anything we could replicate today. So that, that would be another one. And then we mentioned Mycenae, big site. And this is where a lot of these Greek, the Greek mythos points to this site as kind of one of the origination spots of Cyclopean architecture. Again, if you see this site, see pictures of it, videos of it, we got a lot on megalithic marvels. But again, at first glance, you might just see what looks like the Greek influence. But you start looking at the foundations of these walls, and these are monster megalithic stones that are just multi-ton. So that would be another example. And then again, Italy's got some. Um, I just got to find the names of those. But yeah, I would say the megaliths in Italy and Greece are some of the most underheralded, underappreciated megaliths that you can still see, um, but fascinating to behold. Mm -hmm. do, do you see, is there any, you know, we talk about Sardinia, we've talked about this in the past as, as the island of giants. Is there Cyclopean evidence there? Like, do you like that maybe there's collabs between, you know, collaboration between the giants and, and, and the Cyclops in, in this space that's, that's renowned or known for, you know, for giants. Absolutely. Yeah. There's, um, there's the Naraji or Naragic towers that literally dot the landscape of, of this Island. Again, all the legends in Sardinia point to this was all built by the giants. So you've got these, these Naragic towers, which go straight up. And again, a lot of the tops of them have kind of been rebuilt, but you, again, you look at the foundations and these are massive stones. And so you've got those towers, um, and then you've got what's known as the tombs of the giants. To me, these are even more incredible than the towers in that these look like almost a bull's head and it's, you know, it's imagery of reproduction and 
this is legend apparent according to legend this is where the, the giants were buried mm. inside these things but they were multi-layered they went deep under the ground as well in the shape of a bull's head but these are ancient and a lot of those they're not just rocks pushed together i mean they're they're shaped stone and then you've got uh, one of my favorite sites of all and that is the sardinian wells or again, some people call them the neurogic wells, but there's one called uh, the well of Santa Cristina. And that's, it's just called that because there was a Catholic church built there in like the 1600s. But this thing is one of the most incredible megalithic structures you'll ever lay your eyes on. It goes straight into the ground, kind of like a vortex. It's really weird looking and it's just precision cut. And to me, that thing is the most uh, incredible megalith on the whole island probably predates all the towers and everything else. And so when you see that, you're just going to go, what in the world was going on in Europe? And again, I think it points back to this lost knowledge of these uh, giants that once existed. Hmm. Well, you think that the, the Cyclops specifically had a gift for this stonework that maybe other giants didn't have? And that's a great question. Yeah, I think so. I, I definitely think... I mean, I even think of, you know, just some scriptures in the Bible that talk about, uh, you know, some of the the people that God anointed to build, you know, the tabernacle, right? Or the Ark of the Covenant, God gives gifts. And so why couldn't it be that some of these um, these hybrids had gifts? Because we know the watchers had different abilities and gifts that they were teaching to uh, the ancients, right? So I believe a lot of that probably transferred and um, the cyclopes were most likely the builders. Yeah. I mean, because it seems with the, with the amount of deformities and the amount of different tribes, you'd think everyone would have their, their skill, their, their way. And humans are the same way, right? We have our human beings that are phenomenal at one thing. And what do we do? We put them on a football field basketball court it's crazy too Derek I think that like when you look at the Cyclopean stuff it's not just walls and structures it's also monuments and and almost like sculpting it's kind of wild what what you know in in myth and tradition is is attributed to and and associated with with Cyclops there's a stone head of Medusa there's giant monuments of the ancient world that were supposedly built by the Cyclops and altars and these things that it just, I think when you, when you plug this in to, you know, where we're at Nate in, in, in the show with our journey and in, into ancient giants and, and biblical, biblical giants, biblical narrative and what we know happened, we talk about Genesis six and Enoch and all these things that it just, it fits in. Um, it fits in with the diversity of, of tribes of giants. We talked with Gary Wayne, it fits in with, the idea that there was all this manipulation of genetic manipulation from from giants to chimeras to the Bible says all flesh was corrupted to birds to all, you know all the all flesh and it doesn't seem like a like much of a stretch especially when you look back at the extra biblical stuff like you talk about Homer and these ancient some of the most ancient of ancient narratives um, and stories deal with 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 cyc- cyclops and and giants and. You know, I think it's I think it's fascinating too that even now there's a terminology for these megaliths you're talking about, and it's cyclopean. I mean, it's that to me is great is 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 great evidence, right? Like, I mean, sure you could say it's just tradition, but you could also say, I mean, it's tradition that's been that's timeless that 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 we can trace back to cataclysm. It's 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 wild. It's wild. I mean. I think kicking this off with the Alberino's quote is is phenomenal because it does it does it's like the rocks cry out right. Um, yeah. Well, I was going to ask you something, Derek. So I mean, basically, when you're you're compiling all the stuff on your channels, I mean, you're we're dealing with like maybe five percent of what's left over, right? Of what was here at some point. I mean, when I when I peruse your channel, I'm like, man, there's stuff all over the world. I mean, there's stuff everywhere. I mean, you're pulling up places I've never even heard of, and they're most remote. Um, right? Like we talked, we did a whole show on Easter Island, which is like, how in the yeah. world did they ever find this place? And then we have lo- long-eared giants supposedly built this stuff, right? I mean, see it in North America too, right? At some point, we turned the tables on this. You know, after the cataclysm and the Rephaim were around, 
we as humanity turned the tables on the giants and they, they no longer ran stuff. It was like we, you know, they were hunted. We talked about Lovelock Caves and we talked about, you know, Nate, we talked about yellow hair. And they're, that's just here in North America. But these things were, the, the, the hunters became the hunted. Well, I wonder if like, if you think about it, Derek, and, 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 and we go to the next level, I mean, if we are image bearers, even non-Christians are image bearers because we were made in the image of God and they aren't. Our spirit wouldn't wouldn't be able to coalesce. You know what I mean? We would be we would feel like we need to get rid of these things. They just feel evil. They're dark, right? I mean, if you just look at it from that perspective, I mean, we were we were created in the image of God, and they're not. That would be enough to probably feel like we need to get rid of them. I don't know. That's my thought. Yeah, I think humanity became exhausted, enraged by these hybrids uh, because they were. They were loud. They were obnoxious. Back to the Josephus quote, they were scary. They consumed everything, devoured everything. Again, I mean, uh, the Book of Giants, Book of Jasher, Book of Enoch, they all point to they were corrupting the animal kingdom as well. They were creating monsters. Mm. And so, yeah, I think the ancients recognized we've got to do something to keep them in check or they're going to literally take Mm. over the entire planet. And again, that's why we see uh, originally, you know, the Israelites taking them on. When you start studying David and his mighty men, I mean, they were all hunting giants, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that started to happen all over the world, you know. And I never even thought about that until you just said that now. I mean, if they could take stone and do crazy things with it, why couldn't they take an animal and do crazy things, make a monster out of it, right? I never thought about it like that. You know, yeah, I'm um, speaking of the book of giants, you know, so when the when the Dead Sea Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, the book of giants I believe was discovered among them. And it's this ancient extra biblical text. And it basically seems to confirm what what Enoch hints at in the book of Jasher. And there's this one, it's really fragmented, but there's a scripture in it that says that basically the um the Nephilim took 200 or the watchers, 200 donkeys, 200 asses, rams, goats, beasts of the field, and selected them for miscegenation, and that they defiled and begot giants and monsters, and behold, the earth was corrupt. Hmm. And so again, if we believe that this was a dark world, it wasn't really the golden age that they would like us to believe. It was a pretty dark, depressing era to live in, and that's why here comes the flood. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the ancient alien crowd wanted to be this crazy golden age of greatness, right? And it's easy to kind of look at the structures and say, well, the, the, the people making these things weren't that bad. But I mean, from what you're saying and what we dig up, nobody wanted these things to, to exist for very long. People were hunting them, and taking them down. So they weren't they weren't our friends. And uh, the flood was an act of mercy. And you grow up in the church and you don't understand that. You think, oh, the, the flood was just, just like, how could God do such a thing? And now it's like, wow. I mean, we wouldn't be here without it. So total act of mercy. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting to note, too. I was thinking about, you know, like in Ezekiel and Revelation, we get these glimpses of these crazy living creatures you know, that obviously God made, Um, you know, Ezekiel talks about these living creatures that look human, except they have, you know, four faces and four wings. And it says they have, they have hooves like that of a calf and um, it's just nuts. And then revelation talks about the four living creatures. They've got eyes all over them. Again, if God's doing this, if you take that literally and he's created creatures like this, we we know the if that's possible anything's possible with that i rest my case i mean rest? if 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 humans can birth humans that have a genetic disorder that causes them to have one eye just like that of a cyclops couldn't that happen in the ancient times on a larger scale. Yeah, I mean, do you just think that this is all genetic deformities? It's not that humans and angels produce giants. It's that 
humans and angels completely destroy the genetic code and it just in nature you can crossbreed and you can get a tomato with no seeds or whatever right or you can get an apple that's doesn't bruise or whatever it sounds like when angels and human dna get together it just creates all kinds of genetic deformities yeah and i don't think the watchers necessarily knew yeah what they were even getting into i think they were mm-hmm. surprised and, and there's hints we get in history about this that um, they may not have known that their offspring were going to grow to become these ravenous giants, mm-hmm. um, you know, but it happened. And, and I think maybe as the generations went on, they started to figure it out. And that's possibly why stuff started to get smaller and smaller. And if anything, Uh, It's such an incredible topic to think about, and it definitely, man, just boosts my faith in uh, the biblical narrative and encourages me to keep studying and digging into uh, ancient history. Well, I think the reason I brought that up, Luke and Derek, is because sometimes there's this, I have this thought in my mind of like, how could God allow these giants you know what I mean? How could God have allowed this, this, these things to kind of take over the world? But if you think about it from like a genetic perspective of like it's it's throwing stuff in a test tube that shouldn't be together. And it, it, it's just going to kind of turn into whatever it turns into. It wasn't God allowed the giants to be born. It's that they were just genetic freaks. And they just kept growing and they had all these other weird problems and other weird deformities. And I think that that's an easier way for me to understand that like God didn't allow the giants to to just take over the world and destroy, basically destroy humanity. It was that they were, they were, when they, when you put these things together, it just creates this problem. And I, I don't know that, that to me there, there was just some thoughts that I had that like, how does that, you know, how does that? Well, I think, I think one of the things about that is that, was to remember the darkness can't create, right? Is that the God is the creator, created man from dust and breathed life into him. He created something from nothing. He created light from nothing. He created, he, he is the creator and, and all the enemy can do is, is corrupt. So they took, they took with what was in creation and they played within the lines of creation, but in, in the corruption of, of it mm-hmm. from, from the corruption came these monstrosities. It's not that, God is the only one who creates. And so this is just, it, it really is a defilement, right? It, it's, it's right in the playbook of the darkness to, to, to defile and attempt to mar and destroy those things which God has created and called good. And I think, I think you kind of, I think we kind of nailed it here. Like, I don't think they knew what they were doing or what they were getting. They knew they could, they operated within, within the laws of nature that God had set, set aside and set, set into, into motion, right. And left into motion. Yeah. And, and still in motion today. But if you think about it from like a moral perspective, you see what I'm saying? You could get to this quandary of like, why would, how could God allow the giants? But if you think about it, all these genetic deformities were unknown. It was an unknown thing that just kind of, they didn't, I don't think they realized what they were doing is what I'm saying. I don't think they set out to create giants. No, I don't think so either. Yeah. You know, but it says, it's interesting because the book of Enoch says that they loved their, their offspring. And the, so their punishment was to watch their offspring destroy each other and they had to watch mm-hmm. it before they were imprisoned right and it's like it's interesting that these fallen beings that have rebelled against god still had you know compassion and empathy and, and love for the things that they had for their children no that that's a that's a great point you make luke i've thought of that before myself it's so easy to just think of it in in such dark evil big terms but like you point out we get hints that they were they they were heartbroken to know that they're their children, their offspring were going to be destroyed. And I believe they went, um, you know, to Enoch to plead their case before God. Right. And they did. And when they should have been going to God on behalf of Enoch, Enoch's going, they're sending Enoch to go plead their case to God. And God's like, Nope, you had your chance. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, it it gets blurry, right? You don't know. I mean, and that's the thing that's hard about hu- human beings is we all love our children, right? I mean, there's, I mean, 
And we all look at child abuse as something terrible, whether you're a Christian or non-Christian or whatever. I mean, we see life, I mean, you know, a child getting abused, everyone's going to stop and on the street and, you know, it's just not okay. You don't do that sort of thing. And I think that it's it, it makes you wonder, these creatures. I just think more of the, along the lines of, like, because the giants were so destructive on planet Earth, there's just these thoughts that I always have, like, man, how can, if, if God knew it was going to get to the point where we literally were have to, like, start over humanity, wipe out the entire world. I mean, you, like, how does, why does God allow those things to happen or get, get that bad? Or, but I don't think these, these DNAs were ever meant to, to, to commingle. Yeah. But like Al Barino says, you know, we have dominion here. So there's only so much God will do to get in, involved when, once we start opening the test tubes, you know, so. It's just weird, man. It's just it, the show just gets more complicated, more confusing. But we appreciate you uh, coming on, man. And yeah, Derek, we know what they built, though. One eyed Willie, go touch that. Yeah, right. That we'll go and and let's do it on a future Blurry Creatures tour. Let's go, dude. Oh, that would be phenomenal. Come let's on, go. Now. Let's go. Let's yeah, go to well, Sardinia. Let's get Nate in that well. <laughs> <laughs> down the well yeah with the cyclops were they redhead redheads too derek you think actually i believe they were bald they were bald <laughs> i don't know well, they had that peyton manning forehead <laughs> they had to be man i mean just think of that big old bald one-eyed giant walking down the hill scratching his his cheeks sounds like a dirty joke that's all right <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> I'm half, I'm half dead. Well, Derek, man, I think uh, I think you made the case for One-Eyed Willie. I think I think they were out there. I think they were building stuff. I think they were. Sounds like they were living in caves by themselves, kind of introverted, weird beings. There's a bunch of solitary dudes playing with Lego sets, just in real life, right? Yeah. Hey, we went on the search for Cyclops, and uh, we'll leave it up to listen to the listeners now to decide. Yeah. If they are believers, oh man! I, well, thanks I as always for coming and dropping knowledge. I mean, it's always it's always a it, it feel like yeah. we step in the classroom, and, and we get to we get to learn history as it, as it should be and as it really was. So thanks again for that. There might have been a one eyed, one arm, one horn people eater out there, right? Right, Luke playing drums for Def Def Leppard. <laughs> Is that how it goes? Is that the saying? <laughs> one eyed, one arm. Oh, I don't know. But Google I know the drummer from Def Leppard's only got one arm. Yeah, so. I do know that. I do know that. And that's very 80s, Luke. So way to go. <laughs> way to roll it. Way to roll that time cop, right? That's right. As long as we're talking about one one appendage, that's, that's where we're at here. It just makes you wonder, man. All those nursery rhymes and, and, and terminology and words and Greek history. I mean, it all comes from somewhere, right? When you're playing Zelda next time and you shoot an arrow into that Cyclops, just think they were around at one point, right? All going back to the golden yeah. age. Mm-hmm. Well, Derek... Right. Go to megalithicmarvels.com. Follow you on Instagram. Tell them what. Tell them about your Instagram one more time. Yeah, if you're on Instagram, give us a, a check out. Follow us, Megalithic Marvels. Uh, we have a lot of fun. You know, post a lot of just pictures of megaliths from all around the world. And I kind I kind of have fun trying to find the weird ones, right? That maybe a lot of people haven't seen. And uh, so we post in some reels too, and get you some. Not everybody can just travel around the world these days. So um, we try to get you up close to see them, at least through a screen. And uh, and then it's been fun posting longer videos. Sometimes we'll take these podcasts uh, like I'm doing with you guys and we'll post the video version. So if you want to see how good looking Nate and Luke are, come to Megalithic Marvels and watch the video version. <laughs> um, yeah, close one eye and think, think good things. <laughs> yeah. How many megalithic sites are there in the world? Do you, you think right now that we know about? Oh man! What's the number? Is there even a? Uh, uh, I have no one's ever asked me that. There's, I mean, there's hundreds. I want to say thousands, but then I start thinking too much about the different types of megaliths, and some people wouldn't classify some as megaliths, but they're still amazing, like the stuff at. Chichen Itza, like I post some of those pictures, but they might not be true megaliths, but they had some of that knowledge, you know, that just makes it cool mm-hmm. enough. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, there's mm-hmm. hundreds. But again, true megaliths all have that signature of mortarless. They're either mortarless, precision, and or they're they're multi-ton. Wow. So man, if 
you know, if if you have any kind of imagination at all, you could think back to these days of there could have been thousands of dynasties of giants and beings and all kinds of weird things walking around, making stuff, advanced knowledge. I mean, the, the ancient world, we we have no idea, but we're getting we're getting closer to figuring out some of the stuff that goes on, and and in the middle of it all is this crazy Bigfoot, just staying in the woods, staying away. On Dude. mountain po- on mountain tops, like just like the Cyclops, just doing his own thing, just a remnant. Derek, Derek I, I wanted to ask one more thing before you go. What what, what else are you working on? What's coming? Because I know that you you have a trip to Egypt, and you, I want to give you a chance to talk about that, and then any other kind of projects. I always like to look to, to give our listeners a chance to kind of anticipate and you know, what to look forward to uh, coming out of out of your out of the megalithic marvels lab. I appreciate that. Yeah, we got our tour coming up. February 8th through the 21st. It's our first ever Megalithic Marvels tour. And it's to Egypt with uh, renowned Egyptologist Mohammed Ibrahim. Super excited about it. And uh, if anybody's interested in, in possibly coming with us, we've got some spots left. You can go to megalithicmarvels.com forward slash tours. Um, but what's so, so getting me jacked about this trip is um, we're going to get to go to the obviously most ancient sites of Egypt. But not just the the sites that uh, all the tourists see. We're going to see the true megalithic sites, and with Muhammad as our our host, he's he's known for getting you into the areas, the corners that most tourists don't mm. see. The real megalithic stuff that we're saying predated the dynastic Egyptians. So, like, we're going to get a private tour of uh, the Osirion at Abydos, one of the most incredible megalithic, megalithic structures on Earth. It's a subterranean like Mm. temple um, that is some of the biggest stones you've ever seen in your life. And, uh, but again, it's underground and um, he believes that this was uh, uh, kind of a center for healing. Mm. And so it's really interesting to learn about the energies, the healing properties. Uh, My, the place I'm looking for the place, the uh, part of the tour I'm looking forward to most is going to be our, private tour inside the great pyramid. Wow. We get a two hour uh, after hours uh, private trip inside there to see all of the King queen and subterranean chambers. And uh, I just cannot wait. I can't even believe this is, I'm going to get to go inside. So it's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, of course we're going to have a lot of laughs and uh, a lot of fun together. Mm -hmm. So I might have to pull a couple of strings and see if I can't uh, get you guys to come. <laughs> Man, we'll go, we, we're going to yeah. do the... Mm, I put, mm. Did I put my head wrap on and get on that camel? Come on now. <laughs> so, so we got our tour coming up. And then, yeah, um, in 2022, we're really excited about where Megalithic Marvels is going. Um, working on some short films. Um I uh, did did one or two this year. Um, you can see kind of our first my first big short film uh, was about a uh, unknown, me- a really kind of relatively unknown megalithic site in um, the Black Sea yeah. area. And um, but I want to do more of those. But again, it just as you guys know, it takes a lot of time, a lot of mm. editing. And uh, it's just finding the time to grind Dude. and be creative enough to create those but that's what i have the most pleasure in is being able to create a short film and uh see people enjoy Love it, it man oh we're looking forward for that man. yeah we got to do a make america one so we got to where there's like hidden ama- megaliths in america baby i was just reading about one and like they think it is in montana i think because i follow you like every once in a while instagram will throw other things in there and there's some about there's some archaeologists just looking at Joe Taylor was talking about that a little bit. They think this there's this megalithic site in in Montana that's like seventy two thousand years old. And I don't know how they rate them. You would know this, but there's like so many points of that they give each thing based on on its probability of being, you know, man made and megalithic. And I was like, I got to ask Derek about that. You know, I know it doesn't pertain to the Cyclops, but I think it's super interesting. Yeah, no, that's that's a fascinating site. I've, we've done a little bit on that. Um, uh, there's a, a gal named Julie Ryder who really kind of first 
brought that site to awareness. And it's so interesting because I'm still torn between is this just crazy natural rock formations or, or is it super, super ancient megaliths that have been so weathered they might look slightly natural, kind of like some of the Russia megaliths that you see those massive walls of. And so if anything, it's fascinating. What makes me think maybe they are super ancient megaliths is there's a couple uh, pieces there that look like massive dolmens. Um, that are one is literally like 20 feet high or 30 feet high. And so, but uh, yeah, if you search for um, Montana megaliths on megalithicmarvels.com, you'll see an article okay. we did on that with a lot I'm of I'm going to look for that because I, I was kind of, I was reading this thing and I'm like, I don't know yeah. what some of these things are. Yeah. But it looks really cool and it's here. So maybe we, maybe we do a summer fly fishing trip to my old spot in Cascade, Montana, and then we just kind of take a little detour and go see uh, go see these proverbial. Yeah, hey, we can do a, um, we'll do a mega blur tour to Montana. Yeah. And then, like I told you, there's that site in Tennessee we could hit. We could oh, hit some mountains. On. We could go up to Serpent no, Mountain. Get Nate's kayak out so we can cross the river this time. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, Let's go. We got stuck on one side of a river trying to get to the mountains, and we didn't have a boat. Yeah. We so needed we a like, boat, too, in case Dogman we like, came out. We were, like get out of there. we were like Jaws. Like, we're going to need a bigger boat. We didn't even have a boat. So. Yeah. Well, next time, man, we'll figure it out. Yeah. Derek, appreciate it, man. Well, thanks, brother. Good man. Thanks, thanks guys. It was awesome. Pleasure to be here.